Um, I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Alexandra. She goes by Ali Rivera Gonzalez. Ali is a doctoral candidate in health services research and policy at Drexel University Dornsife School of Public Health. Her goal is to study Latino health disparities and advance health equity through community rooted work. She was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Most of her research centers around the island's health system, the impact of recent health emergencies, and how its current political status as a US territory affects the implementation of health policies, access to quality care, and utilization of services. Welcome, Ali. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I've had a lovely day so far meeting everyone. Um, so today I am very happy to present some work that I am very passionate about. It's very personal to me. Um, and I hope that that comes through as I present it throughout today. So I'll be talking about a healthcare system in crisis and how public health emergencies in Puerto Rico exposed a systemic disaster. So to start, to give an idea of where Puerto Rico lies. So this is the Caribbean. This is Florida right here. So Puerto Rico lies just uh, southeast of Florida, and in many ways, it serves as the gateway to the Atlantic Ocean. So um, it plays a very important role for the US. But some key things to note is that Puerto Rico is an unincorporated US territory, but in many ways, it still remains under a colonial status. And it's come to, to be known as the oldest colony in the world because it's under federal jurisdiction for many things, including disaster response and the funding of its healthcare system. So to give an idea of what the layout is for Puerto Rico, it's an archipelago. It's made up of four islands. So you have the main island, and I included this map because it shows the Cordillera Central. This is a very mountainous area. It's a very rural part of Puerto Rico. And that has a, a high importance when you're talking about the impact of different public health emergencies on Puerto Rico. And then you have the two island municipalities of Culebras and Vieques. Uh, and then to the west of the, of the mainland is you have Isla de Mona, which does not come out in this map. But it also plays a very important role in things like immigration, since it falls right in between the mainland and the Dominican Republic. So in the past about five years, Puerto Rico has encountered a series of catastrophic public health emergencies. So at the end of 2017, in September, Hurricanes Irma and Hurricane Maria, which happened only two weeks apart and were category four and category five, absolutely devastated all of Puerto Rico, uh, the entire uh, geography of Puerto Rico across. And that devastation included physical impact, economic impact, social impact, many other ways. And this is just one type of representation of what, this, what it looked like for months. So this that you see here wasn't just the days after many streets, many primary streets of Puerto Rico continued to look like this for up to a year. And that also includes the impact that it had on the electrical grid, on the access to clean water, on things like internet and phone signal. So all of those areas were heavily impacted for over a year. And then shortly after, shortly after towards the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, there were a series of fatal earthquakes that happened, primarily impacting the southwestern part of Puerto Rico, but they were felt throughout and also caused damage throughout. And then not even two months later, the COVID-19 pandemic happened. Uh, and later, more recently in 2020, Hurricane Fiona just recently brought uh, landslides and floods that also caused many fatalities, despite only being a category one hurricane. And aside from these uh, atmospheric related events, Puerto Rico health system has, all, has also been challenged with a series of infectious diseases that have been spanning way before 2017. And to give some examples, you have the dengue outbreak, the chikungunya and the Zika outbreak, which were all epidemics in Puerto Rico, and many including before 2009, we've had dengue for decades. And that puts more, um, more pressure on the health system of Puerto Rico, added on to all of these emergencies that are happening one after the other. And another thing to note is, these emergencies in themselves 
also create the space for infectious diseases to rise. So things like hurricanes and floods and landslides increase the amount of contaminated water where the bacteria leptospirosis lives and the amount of stagnant water where these vector-borne diseases can grow. So finally, we add on to these public health emergencies all these other ongoing issues, including an economic crisis that has happened for more than 10 years in Puerto Rico, a mental health crisis, the political corruption, and all of these have been both impacted by the emergency, <coughs> but have also affected how these emergencies affect the population of Puerto Rico. And part of the impact of these emergencies is due to an inequitable federal disaster response. Just to give an example, so this study uh, quantified the inequities in US federal response across three different locations that had some similar magnitude hurricanes only weeks apart. So in Puerto Rico, when Hurricane Maria happened, Hurricane Irma happened shortly after in Florida, and Hurricane Harvey happened in Texas. And this study showed uh, the amount of federal dollars that was just that was invested into this uh, public health emergency response to these different locations. Just to summarize, Puerto Rico received much less FEMA dollars and much less money to the individual survivors' pockets as well. And then it also translates onto the amount of federal personnel that were sent to those uh, emergencies as a response. So in Puerto Rico, which is marked as yellow in the second graph, Puerto Rico received much less federal personnel to address uh, the impact of Hurricane Maria compared to Florida and compared to Texas. Meanwhile, in terms of mortality rates, the amount of indirect deaths that were it's, that, that happened because of Hurricane Maria exceeded that of Texas and Florida by a milestone. So in Puerto Rico, many of those indirect deaths have been, in, have been somewhat tied to that lack of a proper federal response. And while in Florida and in Texas, the president um, made more serious toned visits to, to these places in Puerto Rico, we were thrown toilet paper as if it was some type of joke. And this also translates not just to Hurricane Maria, but across all the other different disasters that have happened in Puerto Rico. So that includes the more recent Hurricane Fiona that was in many ways overshadowed by the Hurricane Ian that happened in Florida only a few days later. And another example of how this federal response has been different in for Puerto Rico for Hurricane Fiona, um, the president declared a disaster, but then they, for some reason, uh, limited the places that would receive disaster federal aid, and it just made no sense. So this is the map um, with uh, the, the, mark, the ones that are marked in green were the ones that received federal aid or eligible for federal, federal aid, and that includes individuals living within those municipalities could go online and apply to receive money from the federal government. Meanwhile, those that aren't marked in green could not. And as you can see, it, like the distribution doesn't make sense because Hurricane Fiona, the trajectory was right here. So the, the areas that were excluded were actually one of the most impacted areas by that category one hurricane. And then if you look over here, Loisa is just randomly excluded. And the same thing with Culebra, the island of Culebra that currently does not have a health center in that municipality. So anyone that wishes to receive care, they actually have to go elsewhere. So this in itself was very problematic and caused a lot of stirring within, it, within the population, including this is a, an article that came out of how are we not, why, why are we not included? You know, People are questioning what was the decision behind that federal response. So how have these emergencies affected the Puerto Rico health system? First, uh, I want to introduce sort of the health system infrastructure in Puerto Rico. Um, it's run by the Puerto Rico Department of Health. 
And similar to here in the US states, they have a, we have a public sector and a private sector, but what's different is more than half of the Puerto Rico population has public health insurance. Due to the high poverty rates in Puerto Rico, a large part of, of the people there have Medicaid and or Medicare for those that are 65 or older. Another characteristic that makes it unique is that the public health system in Puerto Rico became privatized as of the 1990s. So that means uh, anything that is Medicaid funds, Medicare funds, or public health institutions, all of that is now managed through private entities, private managed care organizations that are run under the Puerto Rico Health Insurance Administration. And on top of that, there's a very high reliance on federal funds for healthcare in Puerto Rico. All those things combined lead to some major quality of care issues that has spanned for many years. So the public health emergencies only exposed the already broken Puerto Rico health system. These issues had already been happening for many years and I'll be breaking them down throughout today's presentation across these four areas. So I'll talk about health policy like Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act, the impact on facilities, on providers, and on individuals. So Medicaid in Puerto Rico, which was originally called La Reforma with the privatization of the 1990s, has changed names multiple times, which in itself is a problem. The name is very politicized and changes um, from governor to governor. Now it's currently called Plan Vital, and it is funded through a federal block grant. So unlike US state Medicaid, that is an entitlement program, Medicaid, which means they receive a dollar for a dollar, in Puerto Rico, we receive a fixed amount of money once a year at the beginning of the year decided by US Congress, and they'll usually use this 55% matching rate, which is the federal medical assistance percentage, to determine that amount of of money that's gonna be sent for them to handle their Medicaid program. However, this is an estimation. So they'll literally sit, sit down and decide, okay, how much will Puerto Rico waste this year on their Medicaid? That's how much we're gonna, we're gonna send to them. But any fluctuations that happen throughout the year aren't being captured through that 55% of matching rate. And another thing to note is if Puerto Rico, you were using the state formula to calculate how much that matching rate were, because of the poverty rate in Puerto Rico, we would have the max amount allowed amount, which is 83% of the federal uh, matching rate. And like I, like I suggested, these funds end up, end, end up running out really early on in the year. So the local government takes on a big weight of Medicaid delivery. And all of those have led to Puerto Rico using a historically lower local eligibility threshold for their Medicaid program. So we use the Puerto Rico poverty level, and that ends up being less than half of the federal poverty level. And to put that into perspective, so this diagram um, shows what the Puerto Rico eligibility using that PRPL looks like in orange. And then that blue diagram uh, shows what it would look like if Puerto Rico were to use the state level standards for eligibility for Medicaid. And on top of that, Medicaid in Puerto Rico offers less benefits and lower reimbursement rates for providers. So we were able to capture that through a study that was that actually came out just a few months ago online ahead of print. So we looked at the different Medicaid funding structures in the US and how that creates inequities in healthcare access for Latinos in these three states, New York, Florida, and Puerto Rico. Now, the reason that we use these three states as a comparison, two things. First is New York, uh, Florida, and Puerto Rico have a very high percentage of Caribbean Latinos, including Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and Cubans. So their Latino makeup is very similar. And each of them has a different Medicaid funding from the federal government. So New York has a more inclusive uh, uh, has a more inclusive way of providing health insurance. So they expanded their Medicaid through the Affordable Care Act in 2014, but they also adopted the Supplemental Essential Plan 
that was um, that was provided through the ACA in New York. We call it the Basic Health Program, and this mixed together covers individuals up to 200% of the federal poverty level. Meanwhile, Florida did not expand their Medicaid program under the ACA, which means currently low-income adults in Florida that aren't uh, that aren't parents of 18 years or younger, that aren't pregnant, that don't have a disability, they are not eligible for Medicaid at all. And then Puerto Rico, that has the block grant, through the ACA, there was a pseudo expansion because prior to the ACA, the percentage that I mentioned for the matching rate was 50%, and then it was up to 5%, to 55%. But that really didn't create any structural change on the way that Puerto Rico delivered their Medicaid program. So for this study, we looked at the Affordable Care Act as that pre and post period, and we were comparing healthcare access using health insurance, having a provider, having a usual source of care and having delayed care. And the data sources that we used were BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and the Census Surveys, which are the American Community Survey and the Puerto Rico Community Survey from 2011 to 2019. And we measured marginal probabilities and we ran difference and difference analyses. So the big, um, the big thing that I want you all to take from this paper for this presentation is that Puerto Rico was practically unaffected by federal by the federal policy that was the Affordable Care Act. And that has been the case for many years. So if you look at Puerto Rico, which is the green line pre and post, it stayed the same. And that goes for both having any health insurance and having any public health insurance. Meanwhile, Florida and New York which are uh, red and blue respectively, as of that uh, ACA implementation, they both had an increase in the probability of having any health insurance, even with Florida not adopting Medicaid expansion because the ACA brought with it many other benefits that helped states increase their health insurance, their health insurance rates. Meanwhile, Puerto Rico with the block grant did not experience any changes aside from that slight 5% increase. So it has been very well documented, the limitations of a block grant before, because this has been considered uh, for states. So um, policymakers have thought, okay, why don't we change state Medicaid to block grants throughout the US? And these are some of the shortfalls of the block grant structure in general. First, it does not respond to community needs and changes in community needs. It, um, it falls short in terms of the types of benefits that can be offered and eligibility requirements. And it gives uh, states too much flexibility into how they can use those funds uh, and the types of standards that they can set within their state Medicaid program. And that also introduces issues with you know, local uh, preferences on areas that they want to focus on that might not necessarily uh, be directed towards population health. Well, for Puerto Rico, the big limitation of that Medicaid uh, block grant is the fact that that block grant structure does not account for unexpected events like infectious diseases that, that involve uh, very costly surveillance systems like hurricanes, earthquakes, and the many other public health emergencies that, that Puerto Rico has been encountering in recent years. So in response to those, Congress has to sit down and come to a consensus each time to make temporary changes to that percent of the matching rate for the Medicaid program. But this just backtracks everything because again, it has to be a decision from Congress. It's not something that automatically will happen with, with each emergency that goes on and they're temporary. So that creates an instability for how the Medicaid program in Puerto Rico can operate. So second, health facilities in Puerto Rico. Even prior to 2017, the wait times in Puerto Rico were extensive. So going to a doctor in Puerto Rico literally means taking a day off of work. And even with a scheduled appointment, you would have to get there at six in the morning and you could easily be there until 4 p.m. So that's been going on for years, as well as the time to next appointment, which is how quickly can you schedule another appointment with your provider? Facilities in general are overcrowded and under-resourced in terms of 
personnel. So they're short on, on providers, they're short on quality supplies, and they're short on the type of the procedures that they can offer. So all of these have already uh, brought many fatalities within the health system, many that have gone undocumented. But when you add on the public health emergencies, that just, they just compromise the availability and quality of services even more. So specifically, the hurricanes and the earthquakes cause major physical infrastructural damage. So shattered windows, um, you know, some of the buildings broke down, et cetera. They had a loss of electricity for extended periods of time. They had lack of access to clean potable water. They didn't have internet or communication networks. So even con contacting different providers or, or um, those phone calls were, were interrupted with these emergencies. And they were forced to operate on generators in an area that already has limited fuel throughout all of Puerto Rico. So that was one type of challenge that these public health emergencies introduced. And then COVID brought in completely different challenges to the health system. So uh, one of them is the economic challenges that came with lower patient revenue and how that impacted the uh, facilities having to increase their provider dismissal, but also the introduction of telehealth in a place where internet signal is already unstable. So that in itself, created a very up, um, uphill challenge for these facilities and further exposed that lack of preparedness as a health system. So those poorly coordinated local and federal governmental support efforts led to an uphill recovery for most facilities and the financial and physical toll of these emergencies in many ways led to closures of, of facilities across Puerto Rico. To give an example, three days after Hurricane Maria, only three of the 66 hospitals were operating and they were all at full capacity and under critical conditions. Like I mentioned, no electricity, running on generators, if they had generators to, to be able to, to hold the capacity of, of those institutions, et cetera. And then with the more recent Hurricane Fiona, two days later, only 66 of the 150 hospital and health centers had electricity and this spanned for weeks. And then you have the case of, like in the case of Vieques, there were also indefinite shutdowns of facilities across Puerto Rico. Uh, and Vieques, the only hospital that served that island municipality, shut down after Hurricane Maria and has yet to be restored. So any type of emergency that happens in that municipality or healthcare that they need to receive, they need to either fly into the main island or take a ferry. And we all know how critical that can be or especially for emergency care. And then finally, in terms of mental health care facilities, so this paper just came out about two days ago and it's led by Dr. Pirtle here at NYU. So we found that from 2016 to 2020, there was a huge reduction in the number of mental health facilities that offered crisis services in an area with a growing mental health care need. So to add on to that, this is a map of the medical, medically underserved areas in the US. This means uh, primary care providers specifically by population, it's like a ratio of providers to population. And anything that's marked in yellow is a medically underserved area. So if you see Puerto Rico, it's a yellow block. So 72 of its 78 municipalities are currently medically underserved areas. So that shortage of providers in many ways has um, contributed, but has been due to that exodus, uh, that mass exodus of providers for nearly two decades. Especially medical doctors have been going to the main, to the US mainland in search of better working conditions and in search of just better overall pay because um, providers in Puerto Rico actually receive less than half of the national median wage. So on top of that, they end up being overworked. They have to see many more patients and many more Medicaid patients, which, for, which they receive lower reimbursement for. And they have difficult practice conditions that only worsened since, 2000 and seen, since 2017 when those hurricanes happened. Added on to that, in terms of training practitioners, Puerto Rico has one of the lowest reta retention rates in the US for locally trained primary care practitioners. And 
it has few training programs and residency opportunities to be able to gain retention of, of those providers in specialty areas as well. And finally, in terms of population health, Latinos in Puerto Rico have already, since before 2017, have higher rates of cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, compared to the US mainland. Uh, there's more infectious diseases, like I mentioned with these tropical diseases, and there's more poor self-reported health in Puerto Rico compared to the US mainland. Add on to that, the mental health issues and gender-related violence epidemic and these disparities in terms of rural versus urban living and for Afro-Latino communities in Puerto Rico. And finally, immigrant health has been an issue that has been going on for many years in Puerto Rico and has been shortly documented, including that medical tourism of other Caribbean countries coming to Puerto Rico to receive uh, health care. So in the paper that, that came out last year for a special edition on border and immigrant health for health affairs, we uh, brought, brought in this title, The Other U.S. Border, which is sort of consistent with what I've been talking about so far, about how Puerto Rico has been othered in many ways by the U.S. federal government. Uh, and Puerto Rico has, a, has very high rates of especially Latino immigration. So here we looked at health insurance coverage among Latino immigrants in Puerto Rico using the Puerto Rico Community Survey and comparing Latino subgroups by citizenship and birthplace. So overall, we were able to identify that there are major differences even between those groups of Latinos, despite there being less language barriers because they speak Spanish and in Puerto Rico uh, with the 99% Latino population, everyone speaks Spanish as well. And there's also less of a cultural barrier, but even despite all that, there's these major gaps, especially for Dominicans in Puerto Rico that have the lowest probability of health insurance and any private health insurance. And even for any public health insurance, if you look at what that ends up being, it's less than 30% probability of them being insured. So what did the emergencies do to these population characteristics? This is sort of stuff that we already know from these, from these catastrophic emergencies, including unsafe living conditions. Uh, there's a huge unaddressed chronic disease care need, higher risk of infection, and a growing mental health uh, epidemic, right? Because of all these emergencies piled on. But also, these emergencies uh, in really um, strengthened community resilience because of that lack of federal response. So communities ended up supporting each other and coming up with solutions, uh, longstanding solutions to their local issues to handle uh, all of these continuous impacts. And also it led to a type of social awakening in Puerto Rico where Puerto Ricans realized that the US citizenship comes with an asterisk. So in a way we are second class citizens and just to give an example of how that looks, from 2011, from 2010 to 2020 in the US Census, the amount of Puerto Ricans identifying as white dropped by nearly 50%. So from 76% to 17%, and many more ended up identifying as having two or more races. So what are we doing, right? Approaching this from a health services, and the health policy research angle, there are two major problems when it comes to studying the impact of, of the health system during these emergencies. One is the lack of literature. So there's not many prior studies or ongoing studies on the impact of these emergencies or the Puerto Rico health system in itself, and also the lack of data. So Puerto Rico is largely excluded from these national data sets and that's why, as you saw, the two studies ended up using practically the same data sets, which is the census and the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Those are the only two that include uh, Puerto Rico. So what our group is trying to do is address that research gap and contribute to unmasking the realities that have been happening in the Puerto Rico health system using evidence-based work. 
Uh, and first, everything that I've presented so far was an introduction to my dissertation, uh, to my current dissertation project. So I am looking at system factors, provider factors, and patient factors, and how all of those impact healthcare inequities in Puerto Rico, and looking at how these environmental factors, including the public health emergencies, served as catalysts for these inequities, but not necessarily the cause of these inequities, because this has been going on, like I said, the healthcare crisis has been happening for many, many years. And also, uh, I'm currently a, a research fellow on two R01 projects. So one is a mental health assessment pre and post Hurricane Maria. And here we have a cohort, a longitudinal cohort that, that we've been following since 2014. So um, they were recruited as adults ages 18 to 64, but obviously with the years that has shifted as they've grown older. And for wave one, it was funded by the Puerto Rico Mental Health Administration. But our project focuses on this wave two component where we're following up uh, quantitatively on the same things that they were interviewed for wave one for that mental health assessment. So we're looking at mood disorders like prevention, uh, like depression, sorry anxiety disorders like PTSD, suicidality, substance use disorders, and many more. And then the second component to the study is this added uh, documentation of their hurricane experience and the impact that the hurricane had on them as individuals, their preparedness for the hurricanes, and their individual resilience in response to these. Uh, and finally, the gover their governmental, um, their perception of governmental response, how well do they rate the governmental response across different levels, federal, local, community entities as well, etc. And for this, we are currently drafting up the protocol paper. So if any of you are interested, that might be out in the next uh, couple of months. And then the second uh, R01 project is a Puerto Rico health system resiliency study. So I note here, I put three asterisks because with Hurricane Fiona, we just recently expanded it to be four public health emergencies. And we're looking at how the health system has been able to uh, react and respond to one after the other of these, of these emergencies. So it's a mixed method study. Uh, the quantitative piece has two parts and we're focusing more on system impact and patient impact. So through the first quantitative part, we're looking at claims data and hospital data to assess system factors like healthcare expenditures, like reimbursement rates, like uh, you know provider trends, et cetera. And then for the second quantitative portion, we're following up for a third time with that longitudinal cohort study that I, that cohort group that I mentioned earlier, but documenting specifically their healthcare experiences anchored to each one of those four emergencies. And then for the qualitative piece of this mixed method study, we're focusing more on facilities and providers. And for this, it's a more community engaged approach because these health system leaders and healthcare providers are actively involved in the design and tailoring of the studies towards their own needs. So we're having already having conversations with them and outreaching in other ways, including emails, Zoom calls, but they are all involved in where this is gonna be directed and eventually this will lead to focus groups and finally the, the interviews. They're helping design what kinds of questions we end up asking based on what their experience was. Hopefully, right, these are kind of the areas that we wish to, to gather with this qualitative portion, which is the, their preparedness, their recovery, the impact of the emergencies and any challenges that they encountered and their ability to translate those lessons learned from one emergency to the next if any. And just to shout out some, some organizations that already have been actively involved in this, we're, we're collaborating with the Association of Primary Care Puerto Rico and the Association of Hospitals in Puerto Rico. And when I say a we, this is what I'm referring to. So um, at Drexel, the principal investigator for these projects is Dr. Alex Ortega. And we have some co-investigators, including Dr. Scarlett Bellamy and Dr. Jim Simpson. And then we have the graduate fellows who do much of, of the hard work as well. So Damaris, if you're on the call, shout out, because uh, you're one of those as well. 
Uh, and then we also collaborate on both of these projects with the University of Puerto Rico through the Behavioral Sciences Research Institute. So the co-PI for these projects is Dr. Glorisa Canino and their awesome research team that uh, leads most of the data collection and, uh, and cleaning. And finally, here at NYU, uh, Dr. Pirtle is one of the co-investigators on both projects. And Dr. McSorley has more recently been added to our team. And some other collaborations that I believe contribute significantly to the work that we're doing. First is the Boricua Trio, which is composed of three Puerto Rican women doing Puerto Rico research. Ana Michelle McSorley is one of those, and Damaris is, is the other one. And we meet regularly to talk about the Puerto Rico health system issues and potential for publication together. So it's a very collaborative and supportive uh, group. It's been absolutely amazing. We've been doing it for a few months now, and hopefully, you know, our expectation is for it to turn into a body cut, body cut collaborative to include other Puerto Rican scholars as well into this work. And more informally, uh, I'm also involved with different groups that are trying to frame what a type of universal coverage might look like for Puerto Rico very early on in the conversation and very casually. But uh, we hope to take that somewhere in a few years, and also La Brigada Saludista, which is a nonprofit organization. It started in 2017 after the hurricanes, and it's just a group of volunteers from the University of Puerto Rico from different health sciences uh, fields. So we have medical doctors, we have dental, we have uh, dentistry students, we have anthropologists, public health, we have even vets that join these and their brigades where we go to communities to help um, communities that don't necessarily reach these federal aids because of their location, because they're too isolated or it's difficult to get there. So those, brigade, those brigades have been activated for each of these uh, emergencies. And overall, our recommendations, which are also the goals of our projects, first is to bring awareness to the issue, but not just bring awareness to academic scholars, we also wish this to be translatable to first, to the general population in terms of language, so translating our work to Spanish, but also in terms of how accessible it is to them, so changing the type of way that we communicate these issues, the language that we use, et cetera. Second, we hope to address the research and data scarcity and improve the transparency of this data. We wish to inform local and federal policy change for repairing the Puerto Rico health system through the work that we're doing. Uh, we hope to support community empowerment and that primarily is happening through that interaction with the community health centers, which are stakeholders within their own communities. And finally, translate the, the, the emergency preparedness to a broader context, considering the increase in atmospheric related events from climate change. So in Puerto Rico, we've experienced multiple emergencies, one on top of the other, what lessons learned can be translated to other locations preventively. And finally, I wanted to close off with this uh, quote by Nelson Dennis. This book, if you're interested in knowing about the history of Puerto Rico as a US colony and as a Spanish colony and the years of repression and human rights violations that have happened uh, throughout you know, decades and centuries. Uh, this book it does an excellent job of documenting that. But from there, I picked up this quote that says, Puerto Rico is an island separated by an ocean, a language, a culture, all of that put in a position where it's like, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but what happened in Puerto Rico never happened at all. So unfortunately, it took these uh, major catastrophic events to sort of put Puerto Rico back on the map for that federal government. But there's still a lot of work to be done. And you know, highlighting these issues is only one part of it, but it's definitely an important part of it. So to quote uh, Dr. Yellowbird, Dr. Michael Yellowbird, he says, Decolonize decolonization starts in the mind. So that's uh, you know, hopefully what we're doing with our research is bringing attention to the issue and you know, filling that knowledge gap so that we can translate our work to bridge um, research and practice and hopefully create some type of change.
Excellent presentation, so that's good. Thank you so much for having me. I suppose open the space if anyone has any comments or questions. Do we have any questions in the room or on the Zoom? So I'll ask you something. So, so you you painted you painted a very pessimistic picture of what's going on there. That I when I look at it, I'm like, where would I start? Yeah. I like I like the idea that you mentioned on data, the lack of data, because that's a problem that every territory has, right? And if you can make F, just having data is going to be a huge service. But the question that I have for you was the following: Are have you seen any in this type of environment any uh, healthcare provider, hospital, health plan that has been able to serve the island, given? despite everything that you described, the lack of resources. Somebody must be I'm trying to think like who I would ask of like, how do you survive in these environments? Yeah, of course. And I think the that project where we're collaborating with the community health centers has been a huge learning experience for me in that aspect, because these community health centers have developed their own sort of resilience plans, you know, within the, in, face of that lack of federal support and even local government support. So I'd say those community health centers are a good place to start. They have already implemented programs um, where they're applying for their own grants to get the resources that they need. They're identifying the needs within their own communities and doing outreach. So for example, um, with the hurricanes, especially in the mountains where many of the streets were blocked off, they invested in things like tractors um, you know, or big machinery that it might not necessarily fall when you think of health systems, right? You don't necessarily fall as that being a necessary purchase, but in this case, for them, it's important because they need to be able to reach these communities that they're impacting, right? So um, I'd say that's a good place to start. Um, hospitals as well have, have done kind of their, their own internal redesigning, and that's primarily what we want to communicate through that project not just bring like the criticism, right, that, that, I, that you mentioned, not just show the, the bad parts, but also show what has been done, what are the lessons learned, and how can this apply to other contexts? And one, one area that I, when I was listening to you now, and like for example, like the, because of the number of people that have left the island, to run a health department and run, and run these agencies and be able to advocate for yourself at the federal level, you need people that have the technical uh, capacity to do it and the numbers and, and the ability to deal with FEMA and deal with all these agencies. Have you seen any effort on that or any um, interest in increasing capacity for that? Yeah, so I would say that um, the growing, um, you know, the young scholars that are growing now are definitely being raised with a different type of mentality, including breaking down these systems that have been in place for many years. And also, you know, the, these younger populations are becoming more educated. So whether it be through self-education, through the internet, but also we're going to, we're completing studies, you know, many of us are going on to do our master's at, uh, in different in our different fields as well as our doctorates in our different fields and that in itself creates networks to uplift the the work and communicate it right to these faces like what you said like the federal government like FEMA and, and all those and all those things so I do think that more informally there are groups that have been doing it in their own way I guess there just needs to be a type of cohesion between those efforts because there are many, for example, nonprofits that advocate for the regions that they serve, and they're going to Congress to debate these things. They're going to to the U.S. to bring to bring light to the issues that their communities are facing. But there definitely needs to be some type of like Puerto Rico wide initiative. And I'd honestly say that that collaboration that I mentioned, um, that one right there, the Puerto Rico Universal Coverage Group. It's very special. I have just recently start, get started getting to know the people working on this initiative, and that's not the formal name. I just kind of put that to reference it. But um, with them, 
they're, they're combining medical students, medical providers that are retired and medical providers that are active. And they're having these conversations of what it would look like to actually make some type of structural change to the health system and how viable it is, even with the current funds, right? Not necessarily gaining more funds, which would be great, but like how to redirect what, what's currently set in place. So that's just one example. I do agree that there needs to be some more like centralized effort. Hopefully that turns into to that. I, I had a technical question or a, a factual question for you. Um, Ali, if you close your slides, we'll be able to see the people on the Zoom. Well, or, or don't. I'm in the clouds. <laughs> um, I'm Diana Silver, um, and we're going to talk later. But I do <laughs> want to just clarify, as I recall, and I don't remember fully, so that's my question, really. Puerto Rico was also ex not uh included in it's not just the medic it's not just the aca it was it's not just the part of the aca that you were describing it's also the subsidies right so you know it's above the medicaid the people above the medicaid line in the in the, on the mainland could be eligible for subsidies but that's excluded in puerto rico is that correct yeah so that's also so puerto right. rico does not have a marketplace because of that because right, so, all, so yeah, that, through the ACA, yeah. states were given funds to establish their marketplaces. But in, in Puerto Rico's case, since we don't receive those types of subsidies, we don't get a marketplace either. So it just it's it, it adds right. on so to, to the right. fact, yeah. Right. So your trend lines where you're showing essentially, uh, you know, uh, that Puerto Rico basically doesn't change as a result of the ACA. Note, of course, that New York doesn't change all that much either. There's some increase, but largely in New York, we had expanded Medicaid eligibility long before the ACA happened. And that's that's true in a number of other states. But that that's also part of the discussion. And I just, I didn't get that point, but I, anyway. So thanks for clarifying that. And then the second questions I wanted to sort of ask are, you know, they're kind of like strategy political ones and they pick up a little bit on what Jose had, had brought up and comparison ones, I guess. Um, so as I understand, as I recall, and again, I don't know why these figures stick in my head, but Puerto Rico is the largest of territories that does not have representation. But if you roll together everybody else, right, you're at about 6 million people and then that also do not have, that are that are considered people living in territories. Is that correct? Yeah, so Puerto and, Rico, current. Well, yeah, it's like three and a half million and then, or three, whatever, and then. In the, yeah, in the, in the US mainland, yeah. Right, and so I just wondered if you have any sense of the way in which these things have affected Puerto Rico and the way in which the Puerto Rican health system has been funded and constructed. Is that similar across other territories that also similarly do not have that kind of representation in Congress? Yeah, of course. So I can't necessarily speak onto other territories because I have not studied um, their context specifically, right? But I do know to use U.S. Virgin Islands as an example yeah. because they also were impacted by Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma. They had a similar situation where um, being on, on, you know, a non-self-governing territory, although the United Nations took Puerto Rico off of that list formally, but in many ways we're still non-self. Uh, a non-self-governing territory. So that impacts things like disaster response, right? And the decisions that are made in Congress, because again, the person that we have in Congress is fully symbolic. So, and to give context, Puerto Rico does not have the right, uh, Puerto Ricans in, in Puerto Rico and the islands do not have a right to vote for president or vice president. And we do not have representation in Congress, voting representation. So we have a symbolic representative and whatever they say does not impact in terms of numbers, the right, decisions right. that can get, be Yeah, no, I understand. I, it's not the political, I mean, I guess what I was asking is given that there, if you're saying that the US Virgin Islands similarly affected by some of the same emergencies, although Solomon Islands and Guam have also encountered a number of different kinds of natural disasters. And so if you're thinking about doing this kind of, I guess in an evaluation framework, we call it almost like a positive deviant approach, which is you're finding like 
you know, who's doing really well given the horrible context, right? I wonder if it's worth also thinking about at least including some of the positive deviance again, so it's weird language, but whatever, um, in other places. Um, again, for contrast, and also because for all we know, there's some insight there as well. And I wondered if you guys yeah. had given that any thought. Yeah, that's definitely, so our group specifically had the projects that we're doing are based in Puerto Rico, but you know, as a collaborative, including like with Ana Michelle, this has been brought up as well, you know, the including other territories in these comparisons might also give insight to like more a more structural uh view of this territorial status because i do know that all territories have high poverty rates all territories have you know difficult conditions and are impacted by these public health emergencies and are served by these block grants so it's, it translates across i do think it'd be interesting to compare but i also think that the outcomes would not be great in any of the territories. No, but that's not the reason to compare, right? I mean, there's both exactly. there multiple yeah. reasons, uh, but to the degree that you're looking for examples that within those contexts work, they may also be insight, you know, you might get some insights from them. Yeah, that, that's actually a great point. So, anyway, we'll talk about it more later. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, my question is a bit of a piggyback as well on uh, Dr. Pagan. So if you could build your dream intervention, what is your dream intervention in Puerto Rico right now? That's a tough, <laughs> I do know. Um, so uh, first I will say it's definitely multi-level, multi-sector. So it's not just one big solution. There needs to be changes that happen across all the levels that I presented, right? Like what I said, system, facilities, providers, individual, but also there needs to be like a restructuring of the health system as a whole. So through conversations with the group that I was saying, one of the ideas that we have is revisiting the model that Puerto Rico had before the 1990s. So before that, that privatization of the public health system, Puerto Rico operated under a type of socialized healthcare delivery where it was regionalized. And that meant that wherever you lived in Puerto Rico, you had a primary health center to go to. And if, if you needed more specialized care, you'd go to another facility you know, within your area. And then for, for super specialty care, you'd go to like Centro Medico, which is the public hospital in Puerto Rico. So we're thinking of kind of, re, what, what would it be like to readopt that type of system that would give equitable access throughout Puerto Rico to healthcare? And that would also involve handling the, the tricky question of health insurance companies. So, you know, you said ideally, we just kind of eliminate health insurance companies in Puerto Rico and go for a single payer system where, where everything is managed through a board of, of directors, like a board of providers or, you know, stakeholders within the healthcare system that can manage how healthcare is distributed, how those funds are, are distributed and, and whatnot. But, to do that, it, it requires a lot of change. Um, it is not that far reach in terms of economic viability, but in terms of political challenges because of how powerful health insurance companies are in Puerto Rico, and they are a type of monopoly and they are very involved with the local government structures, unfortunately, that um, take is gonna take a bit more of um, kind of hands-on activism uh, going to the streets protesting type of situation but kind of where where, where we wish to go there was another question in the back yeah, yeah. uh and so my question i'm curious about like how to improve the retention rate of the physician in the puerto rico because just during the presentation you just mentioned that uh the physician in the puerto rico only receives uh, about half of the wage in the united states so I was wondering like how to improve their wage to better uh, retain the uh, retain the physician in the Puerto Rico instead of working into the United States. So do you think there's uh, any better methods like improving the wage or improving your working condition or offering work working opportunity to uh, like improve the retention rate? Yeah, of course, and great question. So. 
I do think that there are already programs established even in the US main lab that can be used as like that evidence to implement um, provider incentives to stay. One of them would be helping them pay for their, for their debt of what, what it costs them to study, right? Saying, okay, well, if you practice in this area, then you know this designated area that's underserved at the time, and then um, there could be some type of control of where these providers are being sent for a period of time will help you with that with that um, medical debt right from from your study. That could be one approach. But also, I think it's um it's more of a social factor as well that many of these providers want to stay but they can't. And the training programs would be one of the factors that need to be filled. So there's very limited spaces for, for people in Puerto Rico to study these medical practices and beyond that to specialize in the areas that they're interested in. So with these emergencies, multiple residency programs shut down because of the lack of funds to the education system in Puerto Rico. So that kind of reintroduces the, the issue of the federal government neglecting Puerto Rico for so long that the money is not being channeled into the health system nor the education system. That's a big part of gaining that, that provider retention, providing opportunities for them to develop and see, like see themselves practicing in Puerto Rico. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Um, I have a question about that um, picture you showed where it was um, showing which areas were eligible for the government um, funding, I think it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm the listening. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so what was the government explanation for that, even though the other areas were harder, harder hit? Um, by the design? Great question. Yes. So the formal, and honestly, it, it was not just the federal government because who informed this decision was actually the local federal government. So the Puerto Rico governor was the one who sent that list of who should be eligible, right? But then the federal government did not do their, their part either in kind of being there on the ground and seeing the reality of what's happening. They kind of blindly trusted um, what was told and, and implemented this, this system. So the, the standard was the amount the, of water rain rain that was that was accumulated in those areas so um, rainfall but that was not the issue in terms of the impact of hurricane fiona because there was not that much rain mm -hmm. the issue was the over flooding of the rivers mm -hmm. and landslides so what by the rivers um leaving how do you say causa um, like leaving their their natural um, route right they were they overflowed and they they ended up flooding homes in areas that not, did not necessarily receive a lot of rain. So Loisa is a good example. It's a very easily floodable community to start with, right? And even before Hurricane Fiona, those communities were told to evacuate because the government was purposely gonna open the river, the river um, like blockades to relieve the pressure on the river so that it didn't overflow in other, in other areas. So before the hurricane, they were like, all right, evacuate your communities. They opened up, they purposely flooded those communities, but technically Loisa did not receive big amounts of rain, but their communities were flooded for weeks and their, house, their houses were damaged. Then they don't have any type of federal assistance to recover on things like um, you know, electronics that, that were ruined by the waters, beds, mattresses, right? Like so many things that are basic necessities but they weren't considered because they didn't fall under that. Do you think that the standard that FEMA uses, or is it something that they just made up? I, I'm not sure, but I honestly think it was probably made up because like with the press conferences that were done with the governor, he was just questioned on his decision. Somebody said, we have a bucket that measures how many inches fell in each community. Exactly. It's like, I, I'm not, I'm not like familiar. School. I feel like it was a page two that got left off. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not how it works. <laughs> The West Coast. <laughs> yeah. But within a case like Loisa, it's not surprising at all because that is, uh, let's say, that's a municipality that's been um, marginalized in many ways. It's predominantly Afro Latino, uh, that municipality. So it's, you know, it's just like consistent with what's, with what's unfortunately been happening for so long. And I'm telling you, when I saw this map the day that it came out, I was like, 
What? Like, are somebody, you serious? So, it's so obvious somebody would call them that, call you in that way. Exactly. Right. No. Right. And, and of course they did. And they did repair. They, um, I think, like a few days later, a few weeks later, they ended up providing some type of, of aid to everyone. Because the, the local government's argument was, even those uh, municipalities that aren't covered through this will still receive some type of aid, right? That was what the local government was saying. But again, when you go into the FEMA website and you want to apply for assistance individually, you're not eligible because you don't fall into these municipalities, right? So it ended up it ended up changing because of community resilience. That's what I'm saying. Like the communities went out to a protest the like the injustices and like nonprofits from these areas. But what makes the part. what is there something different? Like you said, the Luisa's Afro Latina. Is so there something other structural issue of why they would ignore like leave those counties? Those well, these these areas are actually highly rural areas mm -hmm. as well. Um, not so much mountainous, but um, so few less population. Yeah. Yeah, but also this this was just like a big question mark for me. Honestly, I have no idea because I'm telling you, Hurricane Fiona, the trajectory was like here. Like right at, why would you exclude, you know, the the areas of um, a black neighborhood if it's low income? I mean, there's lots of reasons why. Well, yeah, yeah. So like my so Anyasco is where I'm from, that's where my family is, and that's part of the excluded part. Our Playa Añasco is completely flooded and inundated. Um, a lot of that infrastructure has been largely ignored and abandoned for years, and it's exactly local community effort to try and rebuild it, but it's not coming from like governmental support. So it's already a region that has been ignored and excluded yeah. and is now being further um, under-resourced. Yeah. Think about it as also, so this is the metropolitan area. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this, is, this is the metropolitan area right here. Anything that falls outside the metropolitan the area. Right. So, no, but, <laughs> no, but your point is really fascinating because even when I saw this, I was like, so San Juan is where a lot of people will hang out, right? They'll hang out in the city area, which is a lot of like, you see the green at the, and so, but then Rincon is now called Little America. This is practically, you don't speak Spanish. No, like, there is amazing. It yeah. wasn't like you go there and it feels like you're in a part of the United States. And I am baffled by the fact that they're not included in yeah. this. Yeah. But Rincon is very small. It's a very like beach town. Yeah. So it's it's a different vibe. I'm not I'm actually not surprised. And again, that would be even worse if they just included right. right. Well, it would be obvious. Like, it would then, like, it's away. terrible yeah. already. Let's start by that. But then this 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 caused uproar, I'm telling you. I think you're bringing up a really good question. So I was thinking the same when I was looking at the map. Like, what is it that um, Rincon baffled me. I know. I'm talking like, is it political? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. 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 We yeah. ignore yeah. rural areas even in the yeah. US. But, so that what could be was really true was that a lot of the places that were excluded were precisely the locations where the flooding was the worst. And yep. so that's why it's so paradoxical because yeah. it's like, wait a minute, right? So like, my family doesn't qualify. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But again, it's because they didn't measure it based on flooding, they measured it based on rainfall. rainfall yeah. Right. Yeah, so like my town has a huge river that constantly has an issue of over flooding and hasn't been appropriately given yeah. the infrastructure it needs to be able to stop that.